evening and welcome to this night's speaking conversation with uh, Walter Rosenmeet and Will N. Bowden on religion and the foundations of geopolitical order. As George mentioned, tonight is the fourth and final in a series of evening conversations that the Trinity Forum and the Clement Center have partnered together on, on the overarching topic of God and geopolitics, religion and national security in an era of instability. One thing I left out, forgot, your sign is a lot bigger than ours. That's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> Planning, George, it's all planned. <laughs> so over the last several months, we've had several evening conversations, including featuring the executive director of the Clements Center, Bill N. Bowden, speaking on Reinhold Niebuhr and the prophetic conflict. We've heard from scholar Mary Habeck talk about God and jihad. And most recently, we've heard from James Turner Johnson, perhaps the foremost scholar of just war theory, to talk about just war. And tonight, I think we're going to finish with a particularly compelling lecture on doc from Dr. Walker, Walter Russell Mead on the central role of religion, for better or worse, in our geopolitical world. We're really excited uh, to have brought this partnership with the Clement Center here to Washington. It's been a real delight, uh, as well as uh, a real challenge, I think, to our thinking and many here. And so we're thrilled to have George C. and his wife Gretchen join us, as well as Will Invoden, who I'll introduce in a second. I'd also like tonight to acknowledge the presence of one of our own trustees, Al Sykes, the former chairman of our board. We're delighted to have him here, and Senator Ben Sass from the great state of Nebraska. We're also delighted that each of you is here. We think you'll find this discussion to be a compelling and important one. And if you have friends who you wanted to bring here tonight, who wanted to be here and couldn't make it, we'll be recording tonight's evening conversation and we'll post the video on our website at www.ttf.org. And of course, you're welcome to add your comments to the discussion either on our Facebook page or on our Twitter feed at hashtag. For those of you who aren't familiar with the Trinity Forum, we work to provide a space and resources for the discussion of life's greatest questions in the context of faith. And we do this by providing readings and publications which draw upon the classic works of literature and connect the timeless wisdom of the humanities with timely issues of the day, as well as sponsoring programs such as this one tonight to connect leading thinkers with thinking leaders and engaging those big questions of life, and ultimately to come to better know the author of the answers. And certainly one of the great questions of our time, or indeed all time, is how to rightly understand the human propensity to war and conflict, wisely respond to threats to national security, and order our own government in a way to promote freedom, justice, and flourishing both at home and abroad. In recent years, as George indicated, it has grown increasingly fashionable to insist that progress towards answering such questions lay in focusing on the economic and material, that international conflict is best understood as a contest over resources rather than a clash of ideals, ideologies, or civilizations. In this view, the 21st century is supposed to be modern, if not postmodern, and secular. But as our speaker will note tonight, reality has not complied with such expectations. Instead, religious wars have torn apart the Middle East, destroyed entire societies, and displaced millions of new refugees. Understanding our current international order and the nature of the conflict and the threat to us requires a deeper and fuller understanding of religion and its potency as a prime mover of not only individuals, but also societies. The wise conduct of statecraft in this view cannot be divorced from understanding the motives of the soul. It's a fascinating and a compelling argument, and there are few who can make it with a depth of expertise, insight, or eloquence as our speaker this evening, Dr. Walter Russell. Dr. Reed is the James Clark Chase Professor of Foreign Affairs and Humanities at Bard College, as well as Professor of American Foreign Policy at Yale University. He's also the editor at large of the American Interest and serves as a scholar of American strategy and statesmanship at the Hudson Institute. In addition to his editorial duties and publishing a daily blog 
called Via Media for the American Interest. He writes regularly on international affairs for the New York Times, the New Yorker, the Los Angeles Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post, and many other uh, uh, publications, and serves as a regular contributor to Foreign Affairs magazine. He's also the author of God and Gold, Britain, America, and the Making of the Modern World, which was named by the Financial Times and the Washington Post as the best nonfiction book of the year, as well as Special Providence, American Foreign Policy and How It Changed the World, which won the Lionel Gelber Award for the best book in English on international relations. Responding to Dr. B will be Dr. Will Inbogen. Will is the Executive Director of the Clinton Center for History, Strategy, and Statecraft at UT Austin, as well as an Associate Professor at the LBJ School for Public Affairs, and a Distinguished Scholar at the Robert Strauss Center for International Security and Law. He previously served as Senior Director of Strategic Planning at the NSC, and has worked at the State Department as a member of the Policy Planning Staff, as well as a Special Advisor at the Office of International Religious Freedom. He's a contributing editor to Foreign Policy Magazine, and his commentary or publications have appeared in different outlets, including the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Washington Post, NPR, and the BBC. Will is also the author of Religion and American Foreign Policy, The Soul of Containment, as well as numerous additional articles and book chapters. And of course, he is, I am very proud to say, a senior fellow of the Trinity Forum. At the conclusion of Dr. Mead's remarks, Will will offer a response, and then we'll devote the rest of the time to audience questions. Dr. Mead, welcome. Well, thanks for that uh, introduction. Thanks for the invitation. I should probably say that uh, you know I'm not a doctor, although I play one on TV. Uh, I uh, just have a, a BA in English from Yale, so I'm kind of an imposter. That's okay. Anybody wants to leave now? You're welcome. <laughs> um, it's great to be here at the Trinity Forum uh, with and uh, with the Clement Center. I have old friends. Uh, uh, Will Inboden and I have known each other far too long. Uh, Not my hair. That's, uh, by the way, I heard somebody say the other day that President Obama's hair is now so white it can talk back to the police. So, <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, uh, my own father is here tonight, Lauren Mead. Uh, he's a very annoying man, I must tell you. He sent me an email today saying, I just finished my, my latest book. And Dad, Dad writes about five books for every one I write, and uh, they are all on religion, so uh, that should be coming out next fall. Anyway, uh, when, when we think about the importance of religion in foreign affairs, it's important, I think, to remember that its importance isn't what a lot of religious leaders and thinkers sometimes like to think it would be. So you'll hear... Um, uh, sort of religious leaders saying, well, you know, we are really great at peacemaking and, you know, whenever there's a problem involving that, you should call in the religious folks. Uh, as often as not, uh, people who are in the foreign policy game uh, find that the religious folks on the ground aren't actually that helpful. And also the kinds of people who come to interreligious, interfaith conferences and that work on this are usually not the kind of people that those 18-year-olds or 14-year-olds with guns are interested in. So we look at, say, in Nigeria, we see that Boko Haram is not only waging a religious war against the Christians in Nigeria, but it's waging a war against the traditional and very moderate and peace-minded Islamic leadership of northern Nigeria. And in the same way, some of the Christian groups involved in the conflict are Pentecostal churches or others who aren't all that interested in what American or uh, academic religious leaders in other countries have to say, not interested in denominational leadership, or perhaps in the case of the Nigerian Anglicans, they're much too interested in trying to get the, drive the American Anglicans out of the uh, Anglican <coughs> communion 
to work with them on peacemaking in Nigeria. So it's not that. Uh, you will also hear sometimes that um, religious leaders can advise presidents and others on, on the morality of their foreign policy choices. And it's certainly true that we can all use all the advice we can get. But it, it's actually not that common in particularly the Western world, but certainly not only the Western world, for political leaders to deliberately go about waging what they think of from the beginning as an evil war. Um, and many of the calculations ultimately involved in decisions of war and peace, or even really whether something is a just war or not, are probabilistic arguments. You know, is, is the war winnable? Are the high-minded goals that you have in waging it actually achievable? Uh, what is likely to happen as opposed to what you think will happen or hope will happen? And the trouble is it's very often the case that religious leaders are, are no better prepared to answer those questions than any other group of sort of intelligent lay observers. So the contribution of religion to foreign policy, which I think is is immense and crucial, is not always where the religious world thinks it is or should be. So if it isn't those things, what, what is it? Well, I would, I would argue that in the first place, religion plays a much more constitutive role in building the world order and the geopolitical status quo than many people understand. I think that's, that's always been true, but it's, it's more true than ever in the modern era. Well, why do I say that? In the last three or 400 years, the principal force that makes some countries powerful, others not, some rich, some poor, that raises some boats and lowers others, has been the ability of societies to adapt to the demands of a capitalist society, capitalist economy. Can you harness and exploit the forces of capitalism, the transformational uh, uh, technological advances? Can you do that without having your whole society blow up in chaos and incoherence? Are the forces of conservatism that risk, that, that resist all change, uh, often rooted in a in an ancient picture of the way things ought to be or of the natural social order. Um, are you, you know, are those forces so strong that capitalism threatens to burst them asunder and say like the wars that you had in France between the Catholic Church and the Revolution, which shaped a century or more of French history and both slowed down France's adaptation of capitalism and its ability to move forward and made that process very difficult. Is it, is it like that? So religion's role in the formation of ideas and attitudes about capitalism is one of the most important factors in determining where countries stand in the international power competition. Henri Bergson, the French uh, philosopher, uh, used to write about two kinds of society. He, he invented this concept that we hear so much of today, the open society uh, and the closed society. And for Bergson, an open society was, a, or let's start with a closed society. So if you want to look at an example of a closed society, look at a hive of bees. Every bee knows what it's supposed to do. The worker bees don't rebel against the queen and say, okay, we need a republic. Or, you know, I'm tired of being a worker, you know, flying out to the pollen. I want to nourish the young eggs. You know, you know, every bee is assigned a job and it does its job. And bees don't change. Uh, if bees had a history, it would have ended millions of years ago. The beehive has assumed its final form. And obviously that's an ideal type, but that's what a closed society might be. An open society is sort of the opposite from that. 
where any kid growing up is not bound by the choices their parents made of profession, of religion, of location, their status can rise or fall, where social institutions are tested by reason, where there's a free and open debate, and where society is open to a number of different courses. Now, it should be fairly obvious that a clo closed society and capitalism don't mix very well. Capitalism is an engine for social upheaval and change and innovation. And you try to introduce capitalism into a closed society, and you tend to get explosions and fermentation. And ultimately, society may not be that closed, but also may not be that happy. Well, Bergson, and this is, this is forgotten by a lot of people today who talk about both open and closed societies, Bergson argued that rather than the conventional secular view, that religion is the enemy of the open society. I think it was Sartre who said mythology is always on the side of the right. Bergson argues that religion is actually behind both forms of society. And he identifies static religion, which is religion that sort of tries to, to keep people con in conformity to the, the past as one kind of religion, and dynamic religion is the religious impulse that leads to an open society. Well, what does he mean by that? He talks about, um, as an example, that you know, in, the, in the beehive, the bees have instinct. So you know, there's no question, there's no conscious struggle about whether the bee should do what the bee is supposed to do. The bee just does it. But for human beings, even in very close societies, there are struggles. You're a young boy of the fish totem in your tribe, and you're not supposed to marry a girl of the bear totem, and yet, you know, she's really cute, <laughs> and you kind of like her. And this sets up a conflict that, and, and Bergson argues that what, if you, if you listen, look at the anthropological studies of, of, of groups like this or read what they have to say for themselves, you find that often what happens at these crucial moments is they hear a voice or they have a dream and their grandmother says, drop her, you know, don't besmirch the family. Some, some experience that seems numinous, that comes from outside consciousness and that encourages a conformity with the way, the, the old ways of the tribe. That's static religion maintaining social stasis. But Bergson also knows, and it's something of an evolutionary philosopher who was trying to sort of think about the destiny of the human species and how does this influence our, our thinking. And he knows that human beings may have started in Africa or wherever, but that now we see human societies with very different cultures and customs all over the world. And he argues that, well, actually for humanity, change is as much of an instinct as stasis. And that you have religious experience that calls people to do something new. He used the example of the call of St. Francis, where this young Italian lawyer is transformed by a religious experience calling him to lead an entirely different kind of life. And how the example of St. Francis then inspires all over Europe generations of young people to do things that people hadn't done before. Um, he, you know, one could think of someone like Martin Luther King. Uh, one could think to get outside of a Christian kind of someone like Mahatma Gandhi. People who are called by something they feel as numinous, spiritual, coming from outside the realm of conscious experience that calls them to change. This is what uh, Bergson thought of as dynamic religion that leads humanity, has led and continues to lead humanity toward the open society. Now, interestingly, the concept of secularization, modern, the linkage of modernization and secularization theory wouldn't make a lot of sense from a Bergsonian standpoint. That for Bergson, religion remains a necessary part of human life and human 
striving and, if you will, progress even in a developed, educated, modern, scientific society. Well, the relationship of this to capitalism and world order seems to me to be a very interesting one. But I go back and I read the biographies and the books and the prayers and the journals of the English and American Puritans and pilgrims and you know what you hear them doing is responding to what to me is the sort of ultimate source of or example of dynamic religion, God's call to Abraham. Leave your father and your father's gods and go to a new land where I will show you the promise. That's the essence of dynamic religion. God is in the unknown. God is not in the perfect idealized past that it is your duty to defend and maintain. God is calling you from the whirlwind, from this unknown, unknowable, mysterious future. And you have to leave that which you know to find and encounter Him. That's dynamic religion. That's the spirit, of course, that, that, that led the, the English Protestants to leave the Catholic Church, the, the, the God of their fathers, to leave their country, to cross the ocean, that led generations of, of pioneers to go out west, keep going, keep going. It's a very profound impulse. It's at the heart of a lot of American life even today where American kids think nothing of, of moving hundreds or thousands of miles away from their parents, of changing their religion, of changing their profession, that your life is an adventure. Where many Americans don't have a, a formal religious commitment or conscious experience in their life are shaped in their values by this dynamic call to fulfill yourself and find meaning in change and in risk. And obviously you think about what psychology is conducive to the entrepreneur. It's this. And so societies that are, that are moved profoundly by this impulse are societies that leap to engage with every new technological possibility, that are willing to accept the discomfort and pain and disruption of existing social relationships that capitalist development inevitably produces. And if one look, again, if one looks around the world, it seems to me today that our world has been shaped more than any other single factor in modern times by the 300 years in which the Anglo-Americans, the Anglophones, with a culture deeply shaped by a dynamic religious sense, have embraced the invisible hand and moved out to change the world and by being open to being changed themselves. And so in this way, it seems to me, religion not only has shaped the geopolitical order in ways that people often miss, but we can understand many of the tensions in the geopolitical order from this analysis. Because what's happening now is that societies, and it's been happening for some time, societies around the world who are not moved by this dynamic vision necessarily, but have an old pattern. Think of Japan in the 19th century. The Japanese had no desire to change. They really thought that they, they had a culture that they liked and a history that they liked. And here come those damned Americans in the black ships. And the Japanese realized, we've either got to learn to play their game by their rules, or we're going to be colonized and crushed. Unwanted change imposed from the outside because, again, the Anglo-Americans weren't sitting around thinking, oh, how can we crush Japan? They're thinking, how can we increase our trade across the Pacific? You know, how can we provide better security for the whalers who are getting the oil that we need in far-off places? 
So the, the consequences of growth and development that you see in this, uh, uh, in this process then reach out. And, and I think in many ways, we see it in the Middle East today, where the technology, the values, the, the information capability of these dynamic Western societies that are more or less comfortable with these open societies that we've created imposes itself on the lives of people whose values don't necessarily call them to this, and yet they're forced to respond. Sometimes I say to people that, you know, as much disruption as George Bush caused by invading Iraq in the Middle East, Al Gore actually did more when he invented the internet. <laughs> that, um, you know, that the internet, which changes the dynamics of every company, every state, every communications enterprise of every family where women can now sit at home and access information that in the past they couldn't. Children can see movies and ideas that their parents have no idea exists, much less give their permission for. So this dynamic society, in harmony with its own values and vision, is having a growing impact on societies that neither ask for nor welcome nor know how to handle what is being poured on them in such abundance. You need a religious grounding, education, and sensibility, I think, to begin to think about this problem and to begin to think about what can we do to alleviate some of the stress that has clearly come to pass. So that's one of the ways in which it strikes me that religion is fundamental in geopolitics and world order. It creates a pecking order, and it creates conflict. Um, and another, there's another way in which this same phenomenon works out. Because Europe, and to a much greater extent, the Anglo-American world was so quick to embrace the dynamism of capitalism, given its own basis, international society as we know it is profoundly Christian in many of its operating assumptions. It's not consciously Christian. The World Bank doesn't think of itself as a Christian organization spreading the light of faith. But the assumptions about separation of church and state, of faith and politics, of uh, gender identity, of uh, transparency, many other things that are fundamental to the working of the World Bank and other international institutions only make sense if you understand the deeply Christian roots that shape them. You know, Americans today, I think, underestimate the power of the missionary enterprise both historically and in the contemporary world. In the 19th century, Americans sent tens of thousands of missionaries abroad. They had a tremendous influence. They created, I think, what is it, nine medical schools in China, 11 universities, brought women's education to the Middle East, a whole range of things. Um, but the missionary enterprise in the 19th century was sort of mixed. Half of it, in a way, was about bringing bringing them to Jesus, the other half was about bringing them to America, in the sense of, you know, we went out to stop that foot binding in China, you know, uh, stop feudal debt being. If you look at MacArthur's agenda in the post-war occupation of Japan, it's basically applying that side of the missionary program to Japan. Um, and in the 20th century, what happened is that the two wings of the American missionary enterprise that were that were once pretty coherent, but it was separate, each specialized. So the secular reform and modernize agenda was more separated from the come to Jesus agenda. What's interesting is that as the two separated and specialized, they each got a lot better at what they did. So in the 20th and 21st centuries, 
the, the, the evangelical part of the mission enterprise has been much more successful in winning converts and even reshaping the culture of some significant world countries. Korea is just, is just one example. But uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is, is a, it's been a massive change as a result of the spread of, of Christian religion, Protestantism in Latin America. But at the same time, the secular missionaries whose worldview, while not explicitly Christian, is it, it reproduces many Christian values in a secular context has also been very important. So some of the issues, again, that we have in world order are about the relationship of a fundamentally Western Christian framework being proposed as the international <coughs> order within which countries and cultures who don't historically share that framework are expected to operate. And some of the resistance that you see, some of the passion where China, where China says, we don't want to just simply accept the existing rules of the game, but we need to reshape them in ways that fit our history better. We feel this to some degree as an alien imposition. Again, from the Muslim world, I actually think as, as India develops and becomes more assertive, we're going to hear a great deal more of sort of Hindu exceptionalism and a demand that Indian culture and religion be represented in, in, in a more effective way in the in world institutional architecture. So this, this is a fact, it is an issue, it is something, again, that that if you don't understand religion and can't work with religion, you're going to be blind to many of the most important things around you. Uh, finally, by the way, you know, since my father is here, I, I'll share with you a, uh, a story he told me about uh, you know, how to give a good talk. As you know, uh, priests give a lot of talks. And Dad said, uh, Here's the thing, he said, no matter how great your talk is, you know, witty, insightful, deep, engaging, no matter what, at some point about halfway in, you're going to notice you're beginning to lose the audience. <laughs> you know, they, they start nodding off, you know, the eyes are closed, chins drop, he says, it, it's inevitable. It's not your fault, it's just the way of the world. He says, but there's one way to bring them back. What's that? I says, halfway through, just start saying, finally. <laughs> <laughs> so, in conclusion, <laughs> you see, it works. Even when you know the trick, it works. <laughs> um, thank you, Dad. Okay. Um, the third thing that's going on today is is again making religion more important I think in people's lives but also in international politics and now now that you're all refreshed with that charming phrase in conclusion I can dare to bring these words uh, uh, before you the historicization of the eschaton uh, yeah that's that's why I'm a professor uh, I can say things like that well, the eschaton, as I'm sure many people here know, is a reference to the last things, the last, the end of the world, essentially. And if you think about the medieval world or the pre-modern world, um, the eschaton, the apocalypse, God coming back to judge heaven and earth and all of this, it existed, but it was separated from your daily life. You might believe at a moment the great plague or something like that, that maybe it was coming, but people couldn't do this. It would only come about as a result of an obvious divine intervention of a miraculous character that disrupted and broke the stream of ordinary, of ordinary human history. That's not the way we live now. In 1945, two things happened that put us in a new and different condition as a species. 
One of them was the discovery as the Soviet forces swept through Poland of Auschwitz and the other extermination camps, where one sees that the whole dream of the enlightenment of creating a better human being, getting beyond all of this you know, tedious good and evil stuff that was obviously a product of man's ignorance and, and backwardness. No, in the most civilized, scientific, technical, philosophically sophisticated country in Europe in the middle of the 20th century, a crime of, of supernatural dimensions could take place. And then also in the same year, of course, the, the bomb at Hiroshima. So that just as we discovered that human beings had this capacity for evil, that is something that all the traditional happy, you know, enlightenment remedies can't cure. We also discover that humanity is acquiring the power to destroy life on Earth or human life. Right? This is what I mean by the historicization of the eschaton. In our times, we no longer think that the end of the world can only come about through some sort of spectacular, miraculous, divine intervention. It doesn't take a lot of imagination to see how perfectly ordinary historical decisions and processes could bring about this catastrophic end of the human experiment. So the eschaton has moved from the realm of mythology and sacred history into daily life and daily history. We have not, as people thought, experienced modernity as the secularization of the religious world. We've actually seen the infusion of the secular world with the terrors and the ultimate consequences that were once reserved for religious ideas. Right? The historicization of the eschaton. Now you can all go casually drop that phrase. <laughs> sort of look, look faintly surprised when they don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, and this is this is not just sort of an abstract truth of, of you know interest but no relevance. It changes the relationship of human beings to politics. Because if politics can bring about the end of the world, then politics matter in a way that it was not just about whether my income bracket gets a 4% re income redistribution at the expense of your income bracket. Uh, do we have, do, are our policies making a better, safer world? Are we dealing with issues of nuclear proliferation wisely and well or not? If we are well and good, we may in fact advance to something close to a utopia as the sort of cornucopia of scientific knowledge reveals new cures for disease, extends lifespans, makes abundance more possible. So when it's something very close to heaven is becoming historically so close one could reach out and touch it almost. But also, ultimate extinction is so close one can reach out and touch it. And so politics has a tendency to become, and I think especially at a mass level, becomes a much more passionate pursuit. And you can see it's, it, it began just with sort of Hiroshima and the nuclear peril. But now we look, say, for, for people who believe that climate change is on the verge of creating a kind of an irreversible feedback condition. They talk about, you know, uh, moving to condition Venus where the hothouse effects escalate. You know, failing to get a global climate treaty is a question of universal life and death. So environmental politics for some, again, is not a game of inches or compromise and so on, it's an existential challenge 
that, that for someone with this perspective engages their heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I think we see that too in, uh, I think in the Middle East, there's a sense of an apocalypse, the, the combination of, the, of things like weapons of mass destruction with this sense that the internet, that Western culture um, is, is challenging your religion and your culture with, with a fate of extinction. Again, this promotes radicalism. It makes people who might otherwise be quite sensible go to the extremes. And if they're young and hot-headed and the hormones are flowing, as, you know, I mean, I keep telling my students that they shouldn't be that way, but every group of 18-year-olds just is that way. Um, so we are, you know, you, you look at this world around you, and the, and the cautious, sensible people can't tell you that you're wrong about the dangers of nuclear weapons or, or half a dozen other problems that might lead to this kind of universal harm. And so I, we, politic, the nature of politics within societies and between societies is changing as a result of what is fundamentally a religious phenomenon of the historicization of the eschaton. So those are some thoughts for me, and it's probably enough to chew on for a while. I'm sure that Will will be able to explain exactly where I'm wrong. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Thank you very much.
How's that? Is that working better? Okay, there we go. All right. Fukuyama's uh, vision to, to give a, a long, complicated, uh, and sophisticated book of quick summaries, essentially that with the end of the Cold War and the collapse of communism, there are no more competing ideologies for democratic capitalism, that the world is moving inevitably towards democratic capitalism as the reigning organizing principle. He didn't say there'd be no more conflict or anything like that, but that um, the ideological contest, at least, was, was over. Um, Second uh, school of thought came from the late Samuel Huntington uh, and his clash of civilizations. You know, Fukuyama gets it all wrong. Uh, the nation state itself won't even be that important. Rather, it will be civilizations, particularly religiously based civilizations, that will be the new fault lines of conflict. It was seen as a bit of a uh, extreme and wild-eyed argument when it first came out in the mid-90s. After 9-11, people read it again with a fresh look. Um, and the third one, uh, less appreciated in the popular mind, but actually quite influential in policy circles, came from University of Chicago professor John Mearsheimer. Uh, and his famous book started as an article, uh, all three of these have started as articles and were turned into books, The Tragedy of Great Power Politics. And Mearsheimer's vision was, as he thought, essentially the world was going to be returning to the 19th century, where it is going to be nation states uh, uh, competing with each other over uh, over, over who has greater power, who's advancing their interests more. Ideology won't matter, religion uh, won't matter, civilization won't matter. It's just going to be these competing power blocks between different nation states. And the two great ones were going to be the United States and China. Things to foresaw this great clash between the United States and China in the 21st century. Now, uh, using Walter's typology, uh, I, I think that understanding the religious ideas and influences on these three authors is very helpful for, uh, for understanding their, their competing visions for our, for our geopolitics. Uh, Fukuyama may, may, not, may not realize it, but it's essentially a liberal Protestant post-millennialism. Um, it is the most dynamic of Bergson's dynamic religion categories. Uh, it is an over-realized eschatology. Um, we're talking about the, uh, the historicization of the, uh, the, esch the eschaton here. Uh, this, this triumph, uh, this, this progress in history, this triumph of democratic capitalism. And it has a certain appeal even in our, 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 rhetoric, our rhetoric today. Uh, Huntington, of course, took religion more seriously, but it's very much uh, a static religion. Each of these static civilizations uh, cannot adapt, cannot interact with each other in, in the Bergson, uh, Bergson category but rather uh, are going to be uh, bumping up against each other, competing with each other, uh, having these apocalyptic conflicts with, with each other. Uh, again, some pervasively religious ideas embedded in there. And finally, for, for Mearsheimer, uh, he wouldn't acknowledge it, but he's essentially channeling Reinhold Niebuhr, because I can't be here without mentioning Niebuhr as a fall. Uh, it would uh, be just wrong to talk about religion and geopolitics without mentioning Niebuhr. But specifically, Mearsheimer's whole anthropology for the state is essentially built around original sin. That just as uh, human beings act in their own self-interest, that states act in their self-interest. There is no benevolence. There is no magnanimity uh, in, in, in the state. It is just uh, essentially a rather bleak Old Testament vision of uh, self-interest in a, in a zero, zero sum world, uh, unchastened by uh, religious idealism, but still, I think, a pervasively, a pervasively religious vision. And here's the thing, none of those three ideas is fully won out. Uh, even if those authors aren't cited as much uh, these days, uh, those ideas are still competing for the attention of, of policymakers. Those consumed with the depredations of the Islamic State right now uh, are very much, I think, uh, captured by the Huntingtonian vision, if you will. Um, those who think that as they increase our trading relationship with China, as they mature in their entry into the World Trade Organization, now that Russia's in the WTO as well, now that the EU, for all the travails of the EU, uh, Eurozone, the EU has succeeded in preventing another continent-wide war in Europe, but maybe, uh, maybe Fukuyama did, did get it right, and maybe we still, um, uh, we still have hopes for the triumph of democratic capitalism. Of course, those who look at the great power contest between the U.S. and China in the Western Pacific right now, or who look at the, uh, the Russia's revanchism and the new uh, the resurgence of Russian militarism, uh, particularly uh, in, in Ukraine, but also elsewhere on, the, on, on its periphery with, with Europe, uh, think that actually maybe maybe Mearsheimer did 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 get this right, and so these ideas are still going to be competing for policymakers' attention, uh, and um, I think all of them have some merit as 
as well as all, all have the all have their deficiencies. But all of them, I think, are drawn, whether they realize it or not, you know, again, using Walter's typology, from uh, from religious values, religious ideas, religious religious, religious frameworks. So, so turning to, to Walter's closing comments on uh, uh, first on the secularization of the missionary enterprise, if you will, and then the historicization of the eschaton. If I can uh, borrow a lot of your big words there. Um, uh, those are very interesting, I mean, very, very provocative, and, and are largely correct. But my closing thoughts for us are: What have we wrought with this? If we have perhaps the form, but not the content of religion. Uh, if we have these structures, if you will, and ideals drawn from certain faith traditions, but but no more confessional content, uh, no, no more real real belief. Uh, giving them substance, but also giving them a certain restraint. Uh, perhaps it's no surprise that we would historicize the eschaton if we don't believe anymore in a real eschaton, in a literal one. And our politics, if our politics have become so apocalyptic and so absolutized, uh, it, 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 as I think Walter rightly, rightly warned us, do we perhaps need to turn back to faith, turn back to some form of old-fashioned religion as a respite from this, and maybe even a rescue? Look forward to talking to you about that in our discussion. We now come to the more dynamic part of our evening, which is the conversation part. So in the next 25 minutes or so, we'll be basically taking audience questions for both Walter and Will. Uh, those of you who have been to past Trinity Forum events know there's only three rules that we ask. Your questions be brief, courteous, and in the form of a question uh, to our authors. I, know, I see Stuart in the back there. Just wait, raise your hand. We'll call on you and please wait till the mic arrives. Michael. Yeah, thank you. Excellent comments. Appreciate it. Michael Maybach. So, um, would you say that here in the United States we probably have the impression Islam is a rigid and unchanging faith and that maybe Christianity is more flexible, uh, apropos of the beginning of your comments. So would you say that's fair, or do you think both faiths are fairly static? Well, actually, you know, I am not one of those people who thinks that uh, there's some sort of absolute Islam, you know, kind of platonic ideal Islam. If you look at Islam over the centuries, and you even look at Islam today, uh, you have a lot of different movements within it. You can make the same argument, you know, is, is the eternal essence of uh, Christianity, the popes organizing a crusade or burning the heretics? Is it, you know, the Quakers uh, abstaining from, you know, what is Christianity? So, you know, I, I think when we, when we start, particularly those of us who have strong religious commitments, and I, I count myself, in that group, um, we sort of tend to think, you know, we have a hard time thinking about a religion as a historical phenomenon and separating that from our own sense of belief and unbelief and looking at the extraordinary multiplicity of forms of religious uh, feeling. The fact, for example, that Boko Haram is fighting is a traditional very Sufi and certainly in, in some ways a uh, quietist Islamic leadership of northern Nigeria should remind us not only that there's Boko Haram, but there is also this very mystical side. Um, and it does seem to me that in the current context we are seeing a, um, an upsurge in some of the sort of more rigid um, forms of Islam, I think as a, a result in part to larger historical changes, what will, what will Islam look like in 200 years or 500 years, I'm just not in a position to say. I would say that as recently as 18, what, 49, when, or was it 53, I guess, when Pius IX published the Syllabus of Errors, where he basically seemed to be putting the Catholic Church strongly on the idea that democracy was anathema. And if you believe in things like religious liberty, separation of church and state, public secular school education, you couldn't be a good Catholic. 
And so there was a there were you know there was a time when Catholicism seemed to be. Uh, oh, and Adam Smith was on the index of forbidden books. Uh, so, you know, if Catholicism cha has certainly changed in many ways while still remaining very Catholic, I think we, we can't close the door on the future of Islam. I would just uh, add to that, even if we think about what's in the headlines right now, the Islamic State, as perverse and barbaric as it is, it's certainly dynamic, right? I mean, because they combine this, on the one hand, uh, extremely scrupulous adherence to a certain version of early Islam, along with cutting-edge adaptation to 21st century communications technology. Uh, I mean, you know, they're, they're better on Facebook and Twitter than most American teenagers are, and that's part of the show. Uh, part so of the reason better than the State Department. Department. And it's much better than the State Department, <laughs> yes. So, um, although uh, the State Department is very good with their typewriters, so let's not uh, let's <laughs> so, I worked there for a few years, I can say that. Um, uh, and then, but also, as uh, Walter said, there really is a, a, a contest within Islam for its future, not just among the Sunni, but among the, the Shia as well. I mean, Ayatollah Khamenei in, in Iran is obviously the vanguard of the militant school of Shiism, but then Ayatollah Sistani in Iraq, uh, who has more adherence, although gets less publicity, again, follows a more quietist uh, school that's somewhat more compatible with, with pluralism. And, the Shia across the across borders, across uh, ethnicities in, in the Middle East are right now figuring out which one of these do we want to follow. I have a question. It seems that the, some of our open society today is embracing more of the closed. You know, if you think of like the some of the examples of the college universities who have disinvited speakers because they don't have the right views or where there's views that are not acceptable. Is that something that just were crazy professors or is that is something that comes out of an open society that's gone too far and now embracing the dark side? Good question. I, I think it, it comes, you know, and, and again, we are talking often about very young people Many times these things are led by students. When they're led by professors, they're often led by people who only live in an ideological hot house and don't necessarily have that wide experience of the world. But um, I think what we're, we're getting at here is some of this consequence of this historicization of the essay. If you really believe that your side in politics is pointing the way, you know, pointing the way away from conflict, away from war toward the survival of the human race and all this, you're going to be intolerant of people that want to pull it back the wrong way. I mean, people are, you know, people are losing the concept that there are some things that we all kind of need to agree on to be able to live together, and other things where, you know, there's different points of view and they can be argued either way. Um, but, you know, it's, Political correctness is not only of the left. You find it in some circle. You know that you read what some my if I look at my Twitter following, I see a lot of people ready to excommunicate different Republican candidates or organization. I guess Rhino is the you know is the curse word. Outer darkness with you. So you know again this I think this sense to gather your tribe together and, and close ranks and, and drive out dissent. It's a human response to a situation of conflict, uncertainty, and, and underneath it all, deep fear. And so if you see one of the reasons one values, and we'll talk about this some, the importance of religious commitment and faith and grounding. For faith gives you confidence that even if we're headed toward an apocalypse, the big guy, in case I don't want to offend any finisher, the big entity uh, <laughs> upstairs is watching and caring and that there is love and grace in the midst of, of this conflict. And that ultimately it's the will of that being and not, you know, poll numbers or whether your candidate gets the nomination. That's whose hands the future of mankind is. That kind of confidence gives you the inner resilience to be able to live in a world of contestation and, and doubt and, and so on and realize that ultimately it's not up to you to save the world. 
even though the world needs saving. And that, it seems to me, is another way in which not just concepts of religion, but religion itself and a good religion are needed in order, you know, for human society to work. Now, just to pivoting off that, uh, you know, someone who's at a university now, and universities are at the vanguard of a lot of these debates, but I think it's beyond just universities. I mean, liberalism itself is wrestling with some of its own internal tensions. Some of you may have followed the controversy as the, uh, the Penn Association wanted to give this award to Charlie Hebdo writers, and then some 200, uh, you know, members of you know, led by Gary Trudeau from Dutchburg said, well, no, uh, Charlie Hebdo essentially got what was coming to it because they were making fun of the dispossessed and the marginalized, and we need to, <laughs> we're not about tolerance uh, 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 writ large, but rather uh, we're also about speaking truth to power and defending the powerless. And, uh, and it, it's, uh, it shows in some ways, uh, I think the uh, evacuation of a normative basis for uh, a lot of these ideals that we that we throw around, in which case they just become competing contests for, for power. But uh, it does uh, raise you know, some troubling portents for the future of uh, certainly of, of free speech. Thanks very much. Uh, my name is Mark Tidd. Thanks for your uh, framework. That's a helpful framework in terms of open and closed societies and dynamic and, and static religion. But I'm really intrigued again by your uh, discussion of the historicization of uh, the eschaton. And as you talk about that, of course, what immediately comes to mind is just the, the incredible brutality of ISIS, but also their apparently intentional invitation of the apocalypse or appeal for the apocalypse in their their theology with your framework how would you apply that in terms of recommendations for uh, our leadership and how to reply to that um, or how to how to respond to that yeah i uh, it's a good question i think in some ways actually one of the fact i i'm not sure that the the administration realizes the degree to which the rise in Iranian power combined with a perceived American tilt toward Iran has strengthened the cause of the religious radicalism in the Sunni world and created a kind of an apocalyptic climate of opinion. It looks like, you know, we see Israel, the Wahhabis, at, you know, uh, coming together and then the United States coming together with Iran it look, this look, you know, these are all seem to be signs of the apocalypse. And so our, you know, a policy, I think, to give them due credit in the White House, the intention has been from the beginning to try to turn the temperature down in the Middle East as a way of reducing these uh, stresses and strains that produce this kind of crazy apocalyptic extremist thinking. But the, the actual operation of the policies has done the opposite. Now, the, now I'm going to say something I really probably shouldn't say, uh, but I'm tempted sometimes to think that one of the ways to deal with something like ISIS, with combining our own agenda, we should sort of organize some really elite, top, all gay and all female combat <laughs> and send them over there and basically kick their soggy butts of ISIS. And sort of, you know, and, and if you got, you know, if you guys come back and make more trouble, we might even have to send in the men. Uh, but just, you know, and it's just turning their ideology against them in various ways is an interesting thing to do because they are a response to a sense, you know, among other things, a sense of humiliation and so on. And their ability to command the airwaves, you know, and, and you know, all these poor kids all over the Middle East are sitting playing video games, no hope of a job or a girlfriend, and they're hearing about, you know, Yazidi slave girls and bounty and adventure and, and all of this. That's a very powerful recruiting tool, and the coolness. But one of the things I think we need to do is to sort of find ways to make it clear that ISIS hasn't actually broken out into some kind of mythical rep and some things that rather dramatically remind people that, that they are not a solution to some of these deep set problems in, in Middle Eastern civilization.
I can't talk. So. <laughs> <laughs> the first Stonewall volunteers. <laughs> You've definitely given us a lot to think about. I was curious to explore a little bit more about, it sounded like you were describing this idea of openness to change being an adaptive behavior in a dynamic history. And I thought the example of, of Abraham uh, being a good one where you see that playing out in scripture. And I think you see that in many other places in scripture. But one in particular I was just thinking of as you were speaking was in the Garden of Eden. I think there's a certain sense of for the serpent offering fruit, knowing that an openness to change would make that fruit particularly appealing to create a different order and a different way of life. And I was wondering if you might want to talk to the idea of openness to change, not only being an adaptive trait, which I think you explained well, but also perhaps being a very, in other senses, a maladaptive trait, which can be self-destructive rather than uh, self-actualizing or fulfilling. Well, I think that it would be a mistake to think that what you've got is, okay, there's dynamic religion and that's good, and there's static religion and that's bad, and some religion is dynamic, which is to say good religion, and other religion is static and bad. No. In fact, every person's religious faith and every cultural religious faith and every religion even considered as a set of doctrines, it seems to me, uh, has elements of stasis and dynamism in it and needs to. You know, we, we actually don't want to all wake up every morning with a tabula rasa. And, you know, what is it, Auden said, what is it, without habit and prejudice, I couldn't get up in the morning and tie my shoes. <laughs> so, there, you know, a, a well-lived human life doesn't consist in embracing all of one or all of the other. It actually involves being able to think clearly and, and sensibly about where you need some dynamism and where you need some stasis and, and how does it all go together. And I think the truth is that, that a great religious tradition, certainly the, the, the Bible and, and what it teaches, offers us a lot of, a lot of thought. You know, honor thy father and thy mother is a very static concept. Um, so, the, so biblical religion contains elements of both, but I think the center of gravity in it is more dynamic maybe than certainly some non-Abrahamic faiths. And also maybe, and this would be hotly debated I think, uh, it may be more dynamic than some of the other Abrahamic faiths. But again, I think we need to hear people well versed in them to, to really be able to have that discussion and a very interesting discussion it would be. Now, uh, just to add to that, uh, you know, I think even as the example from the garden even shows us pure dynamism, pure change can be exhausting. And not just exhausting, but almost extinguishing uh, any uh, meaningful normative content. So I'm, I'm with Walter very much, you know, as much as I believe in the dynamism of the American model in American society, uh, it, it can't be pure dynamism to have some tradition and, and meaning. Um, John Foster Dulles, many of you may know him now because the airport's named after him, but I think he was one of the uh, underappreciated secretaries of state of the 20th, 20th century, as Eisenhower's secretary of state, and somewhat of an amateur theologian. And he actually gave a number of speeches as secretary of state trying to provide an intellectual framework for the Cold War using these concepts of uh, dynamism and stasis. And, you know, uh, and he started by talking about the United States as a dynamic society, but rooted in these meaningful Judeo-Christian traditions. And then he said the Soviet Union claims to be a dynamic society with this revolutionary vision, but it's actually become completely stagnant. And I think his analysis was correct that at the time, the United States embodied the best mixture of dynamism and stasis, and the Soviets embodied the worst combination of dynamism and, and stasis. And so it's not just about uh, having a particular mixture of those two, but it's how is it being realized in your political and social life. It was a great discussion. So just stepping way back, what is the prevailing direction that you see religion flowing to geopolitics? 
do you see it coming primarily from the bottom up? Kind of whatever, whether it's a watered, watered down gruel of, of moralism, you know, at the grassroots, or kind of a very religious uh, grassroots. Uh, or do you see it flowing primarily from the top down, from the elites? And that, that primarily informs geopolitics. And uh, whichever one you, we, you, you generally view, why do you see it that way and, and, and why does it matter? Well, I'm not sure I, I would actually put it that way. Because it seems to me that, that the, in a sense, the role of this, this constitutive role of religion in geopolitics that I'm talking about is simply an aspect of the constitutive role of religion in human experience. That religious questions, religious perceptions, religious uh, experience for individuals shapes the way they think about things and do things. It, the cumulative impact of that and, and the weight of religious history affect the way large masses of people do. But I think you, you, you can't think clearly about many human activities without seeing religion play such an amount, an immense role. I think this is because one way to think about religion is that it's the place it, 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 it sort of is the place where the individual consciousness that, that each of us has touches a reality greater than the individual. That you know, each of us is aware of, of, of ourselves as a man. And we're also aware that in some, you know, we came, we didn't always exist in this world, we won't always exist in this world. A sort of a spiritual umbilical cord of some kind. And, and no, there's nobody who doesn't have one, even if um, uh, not everybody has a formal profession of faith or religious affiliation or understands this dynamic in what the rest of us would consider religious language. But it's a universal human reality. And so I think you'll find one way or another that becoming conscious of this uh, as a force and being able to think a little bit analytically about how it works will be of use in any study that you undertake involving human beings, including the study of power. We'll take two more questions. Um, right over here. Hi. Um, I work with the Council for Christian Colleges and Universities, and so our member campuses obviously deal a lot with this whole question of how do we integrate or understand how our faith relates with whatever it is we're studying, whether it's politics, theology, mathematics. Um, and so there's this constant question of, of, and also hopefully growing recognition of just how important and impactful faith and religion makes in life. But also dealing with college students, a lot of people really want practical decisions and things. And so recognizing that there's no sense of A and B than C, um, because no situation is alike. But what are some ways that you think, um, kind of understanding and recognizing faith is like, how would you, um, I don't think of how I want to word this correctly. How would you advise students, faculty, um, people on the Hill, whoever's like trying to engage with some of these conflicts at a local level, like what are ways to better understand, not only for ourselves, how to, to um, kind of communicate some of these ideas, but also to help other people recognize that, because we can only have a conversation if it's two ways. I think your students should all probably read God and Gold, uh, which is actually a, a book where I try and, and, and make some sense out of this. But, you know, you. Um, when, when you think of your, your job as an educator, which is something I do pretty often as, as I teach undergrads, um, you know, you have to think what is your role? And you know, I think you have two in a way. You are, you are an instructor who is giving them information and introducing them to analysis and trying to help them develop their, their critical thought 
And then you are kind of an advisor uh, who is helping them to, to grow individually and develop character. And um, so, you know, you have to, so a question like this, you're obviously going to be trying, you, you need to be able to deal with them at both levels. I think that consists of trying to help them understand some of the ideas we've been talking about tonight, some of the others that people, I certainly uh, introducing them to Reinhold Niebuhr's thought is, is a very useful thing to do. Um, and then I think also you have to try to help them see how you as a human being live with this knowledge and and act in the world in this knowledge and, and, and where it anchors you and where it shapes your commitments and your choices. Because obviously a lot of what young people learn is they, they learn it from watching. And if there's anybody else here in the world of, of university education, we sometimes find that young people at that age are very interested in rejecting their sort of, and, and separating themselves from their parents. But they are still sort of hungry to find sort of a mentor figure or someone who can sort of help them make sense. And, and they exercise their autonomy by choosing the mentor. But then they sort of, you know, finish out their dependency in a way by sometimes taking you a little bit more uncritically than they really should. There's a tremendous responsibility uh, that you have. And sometimes as a college teacher, you may be the last person in a student's life who communicates with them when they're at their most unguarded uh, and most open to learning and teaching. So whatever you, you do and whatever you teach, um, try to act with, with the responsibility that comes with, with that knowledge. And in that way, I think among other things, you, you'll be setting a very important example for them.